Okay, what a day, what a day. So obviously today the uh, Tesla released their production delivery numbers. They blew it out of the water. 411,000 vehicles um, pr produced, 444 delivered, 9.4 gigawatt hours of energy storage. That is double what it was last quarter. Do we truly, do, it does surely feel like we're going into a new book, not just a new chapter, like Elon said. So let's start with you guys. Alexandra, what is your thinking about what happened? They're rocking it. And I think they were very clever. You know, nobody was commenting from Tesla, of course, not, not Elon, you know, over promising and whatever. So the, the downward spiral worked perfectly um, with Troy being much below consensus so you know everybody seems to worship that guy still and um and then came the surprise which is obviously wonderful i mean the energy surprise is only a surprise for people who haven't followed energy it, this is going to accelerate even more we'll see whether it comes to the financials because obviously the pricing has been reduced a little bit but uh but energy we've always explained that there's so much actually you know building up and then also financially building up so uh, because you know so much of the installations have to be accounted for at a later date so there's all deferred revenues coming in um and this will this will play out this year this will play out even more next year so suddenly people seem to wake up so i think the the wall street image has now slightly moved from all cars to all cars and a bit of energy i mean they're still by far not where they should be but at least it is moving a little bit and jeff yeah it was there's a surprises kind of all around um and you know th there's a lot here to look at um i think mechanically they, they they i mean they did what we thought they would do is they would they would clean up the inventory overhang from q1 and the inventory overhang from q1 wasn't like we built too many cars and people didn't want them it's because there are real like structural uh supply disconnects and supply interruptions that we we explained ad nauseum and you know a lot of you know some people listened uh, a lot of people you know didn't and just were continuing to, to question the company or accuse tesla of lying it just it just really kind of real honestly like super negative behavior uh and meanwhile tesla put up those numbers while they were exiting you know maybe 15 percent of the company which is a big deal uh to do that all inside of one quarter uh that is heavy lifting that's not easy to do. You've got morale issues. You've got um, you you have disruptions because sometimes you know someone's let go that was doing something critical that wasn't understood, and, and mistakes happen when you're getting rid of that you know many people unfortunately in that short a period. So this the level of difficulty on this was super high, and you know you're ramping new products with the Model Three refresh and the Cybertruck. And so, yeah, there's a pretty high level of difficulty. And then on top of that, you, you, you know, throughout that quarter, full self-driving, you know, went to, you know, supervised uh, full self-driving, the, tr the free trial, uh, and then the uptake there. So you're going to have, um, I would say, you're going to have some help here on the margin side with the, you know, the cost reductions. So they, they took cost reductions out of, both the the the, the non-direct side, which is kind of, you know, think of office and think of, you know, you know, there's some engineers and people that were not in the factories, and then, you know, there were people that were on the line building products that were impacted. Uh, basically, Tesla kind of, I would say, momentarily kind of resized, you know, their their capital and labor, uh, you know, capacity or effective or useful capital and labor capacity to kind of fit where they are today. Uh, knowing that they've got a footprint and they have the ability to expand and grow as they bring up these new new products. So now you look at the second half and, you know, they've got a pretty big number that they have to go after. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of momentum here. The cars are better, you know, than the cars they were shipping a year ago, Model 3 Refresh, and, and then just the capability with FSD. Uh, so there's something more for consumers than, you know, what they had a year ago. So it's a really good quarter. I, I think, you know, the media coverage today, we can do a whole show on that. Uh, it's mixed. Some are just like, you know, they're genuinely like reporting it the right way. And and some are just like, 
you know, because there's a lot of the analyst community split on the stock. There's a lot of them that are in the, you know, hundred dollar to one fifty range. And then there's a bunch of them that are in the 200 to 300 plus dollar range and they're split and they're, st- you know, they're sticking by their guns. I just saw on CNBC, I was just the reason I was a little bit late. I was writing a note about, you know, this uh, analyst from Wells Fargo, Colin Langan. I just, I couldn't believe the, the kind of like, just almost like lies by omission, you know, during this update that he was giving on CNBC, just literally, I mean, just outright wrong things, but also just like emissions of just like not even talking about the energy side. Uh, he, you know, he ended the, his, his uh, update with saying BYD is the leader in self-driving like technology. It was just some of the more, more ridiculous stuff. And then I looked him up and he's like, Oh, he's a negative 46% and like a half star on tip rank. So, and then I'm like, okay, well there's anyway, I could be really, rude i won't be rude uh for now uh anyway so anyway this, so the analyst community is a bit split but anyway um i'm looking forward to earnings i'm looking forward to 8 8 oh oh yeah there. yeah so for tesla bulls like us though right does this feel like we've turned a page we've really started a new book uh what do you think john I would say so. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think Omar said it earlier in one of the other spaces and and just that, you know, I think, you know, obviously it's great that they beat on the car deliveries and the energy storage has obviously gone up a lot since last quarter or doubled since last quarter. But ultimately, we all know where this is all headed long term. And, you know, I think uh, there was even another quote from an analyst, you know, that Tesla um, is probably one of the most undervalued AI companies out there. And so, you know, I do think, you know, um, you know, Elon has an incredible vision for really long-term thinking and long-term performance. And he just thinks on a different level. And I think most people can't see that. And Tesla is now accomplishing a lot of the stuff that he had been talking about five, 10 years ago. And so I do think that, you know, I, I do think that every quarter there will be some headwinds. I mean, this this quarter was pretty nasty as far as Elon's con plan, layoffs, morale, um, you know, whatever you, you name it. So the fact that they were able to come out with a beat after, you know, a huge shareholder vote, um, you know, on two big fronts, um, I think is just it, it, I do think it's just a solid quarter overall. But ultimately, yeah, I think, you know, what this company will accomplish in the next five to 10 years is really what people need to be focused on. I don't think the analysts or other people will still continue to understand that. Um, But I think that Tesla continues to uh, drum at a different beat than a lot of these other companies are are moving at. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So Justin, Lord Pretty Flacco, you were predicting a lot of this uh, price movement in stock. You were saying that um, it's about to turn, it's about to turn. And it has. Uh, how do you see what's happened in the last several days? Yeah, it's um, it's funny. You know, I made a tweet uh, maybe like a week ago or something. Um, when Tesla is above two hundred and fifty dollars, Tesla's an AI company. When Tesla is below two hundred dollars, Tesla is a car company. Right? Nothing's changed. The only thing that's changed is that the market is starting to catch up to some things that uh, a lot of us already know. So. I think the momentum is starting to kick in, right? Finally, we saw May go basically flat after, you know, the really great earnings report and some of the Chinese, China news that, that came out shortly after. Um, but then we went sideways and then, you know, started curling back up and then really pushed up heavily this last two days. And for me, it's, it always gets a little uncomfortable. And, um, you know, whenever we have these big rallies, and I've said this repeatedly before um, throughout this year, actually, um, that the hardest part is not holding on during the downtrend. The hardest part is to hold on during the breakout. And we're starting to feel that right now. Um, and we see a lot of people, or at least I see a lot of people on my feed, taking a lot of profits. Uh, you know, Squawk Square, for example, sold all of his shares uh, yet again. Not even today. I think he traded today, but then he sold out you know, quite a bit earlier probably one of the worst traders uh, for Tesla. But, um, you know, we're going to see a lot more of this. I don't think most people, if they don't have the right framework for how to think about Tesla, 
you're just not going to be able to hold on. Um, so I spent a lot of my time really trying to meditate on this and um, somehow land on a framework for me to be able to hold on from, you know, what, especially from what I remember in 2019, 2020 era for those who were around. Uh, it just gets nutty. It gets absolutely nutty. So I think we're just in the beginning. Uh, we, in my opinion, we have not even started the rally. That's my perspective. Okay, well, you can't leave us there. What What is your, you know, you follow the short-term stock movements, right? So what is your, I think, um, Jeff, weren't you saying that we've hit the 200-day uh, moving average and that, that 230 was such an important um, hit, uh, marker and that's where we're at today? Yes. Yeah, we've already closed two days now above the 200-day. The, the 230 is, I think, above the multi-year now trend line. I think the 200 day was down to like around 210 or something in that area, depending on like what time horizon you're looking at. Um, so yeah, technically, as uh, Justin was just saying, I mean we're in, we're in a we're kind of in a in a good space, and you could have some, you know, who knows? Um, but it's really important that Tesla closes, you know, at or above these levels. Yeah, and just you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, Justin. Yeah, and just to add on to uh, to what you said, Jeff, um, we're slamming right against that multi-year downtrend line, and so my perspective. So I'm I don't really like to think of myself as as too short-term oriented. Um, I obviously do like to sniff out, you know, when certain things can uh, can can start to move, or which certain areas, you know, I might look to reduce some risk, right? Because I oftentimes trade with margin. I'm over a hundred percent long Tesla. Um, at all times. So whenever I'm trimming, I'm trimming around my core position. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're slamming against this multi-year downtrend line. You know, there, it, it would be reasonable to expect that at some point there's going to be the whole, you know, let's punish the late bulls, right? The people who got in so late, right? Who, who waited on the sidelines, waited on the sidelines, right? Sold it low, waited, waited, waited. And then now they're just like, I can't take anymore. I have to buy. And as soon as they buy, it tanks, right? So, you know, we might get some cooling off. I wouldn't be surprised, especially at these levels. Um, but what I'm worried about on the flip side is that you have the backdrop of the fact that July is the best month of the year for the indexes. And then in five weeks, we have 8.8. So there's going to be some front running of that as well. So, you know, if we do get any pullbacks, which I am praying for because I need more call options, um, if we do get a pullback, I'm going to be buying aggressively. That's just my perspective. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, what do you think, Sat? So to say too, Herbert, you have earnings. Sorry, Sat. You have earnings. You know, in between now and eight eight two, so that'll have some waiting. But I think you'll even be closer to you know eight eight, where people will be will be looking uh, will be looking ahead. So anyway, yeah. There's yeah going to be but an interesting month. The question I've been asking everybody today was, uh, is, is you know, with auto actually turning around and looking good, then you got energy having a massive beat like this. That then leaves it open, doesn't it, for the, the kind of the growth story, the story stock part of Tesla. So people can now feel comfortable betting on RoboTaxi and the bots and and anything else, the AI even. But right b before that, people were very hesitant. Don't you guys agree that that could be the case? Why don't we listen to Sat first, and then we'll get to Larry. Yeah, I think uh, the other part of the vehicle de uh, delivery is also, what's interesting is, I mean, it's cyclical, so we're in Q2, and it's, uh, it's going to bounce back a little better. But the 7,500 uh, tax credit, um, you know, some of the transfers was happening too for the, the FSD stuff. And... Uh, these promos of 99, you know, APR, 0.99% uh, APR, like, I think these things kind of help also. But I think it kind of proves a point that if the interest rate was much lower, and you didn't have to do these promos, and the price of the vehicle was what before like at 2% APR, then it would sell more. So I absolutely think that part of the pricing uh, has a big effect on the uh, sales of the deliveries. And uh, you see that beat the estimates. And I think you know, Wall Street loves to see numbers, real numbers to uh, to to move on. So I think that's why we see a big move. Um, but the and the thing I've been also mentioned even before was exactly what Herb was saying that Tesla energy side, and the energy side of the business has a potential to be much bigger than the vehicle side. 
And we're seeing that now happening, like it's nearly doubled uh, from before. Or so in one quarter or so, I mean, it's just, it's an insane amount that's, that's happening. I'm, I'll, I look forward to the financials for the energy business because the margins on that side is uh, a lot higher. So I think it's just a turning point right now. Uh, if you miss another deliveries, I wouldn't be surprised either because it's a matter of pricing. And if you have 7,500 off, that's like 10 to 15% off, depending on which trim you buy. So it, it's pretty crazy. And then the, the refresh of the Model 3, which I would really love to get, uh, I think really helped the uh, whole push. So Larry and I, with Matt, just did a show on energy. Larry, do you want to give an, a summary of what um, you said at that show? Is Larry a speaker? I can't tell who's a speaker, he, by the way. He's not a speaker right now. I don't know why. Okay. Does anybody want to speak to en to energy? Larry, if you can, please request to speak. Oh, there you are. There you go. Thank you. Uh, we're having issues with the space today. So if you are there, please request to speak. That's the only way. Thank you. Yes, I can. Thanks, Larry. Go ahead. Hi, Larry. Hey, how are you, Alexandra? Fine. I'm fine. Much better tonight than last night. Oh, yeah. Well, it's good to speak to you. Uh, we've been out of touch. That's so, true. yeah, I, I, I kind of strange that something's not working on my desktop spaces anyway. Um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, before we celebrate, we need to see the, the earnings. Um, there are a lot of unknowns in the earnings, uh, margins in both in auto and in um, energy. They will reveal a lot in terms of where we are. Um, and, you know, getting a sense from Elon, or where we're going in terms of uh, margins and auto and 8.8 eight in terms of product. So I think this is going to be a very important month, the next, uh, you know, 30, 60 days as we learn, well, 60 days as we learn, A, how we did looking back and where we're going looking forward in terms of margins, in terms of energy growth, and in terms of new product. I, you know, I've had this the, the, the two, you know, secular debates going on in, in Tesla. The one I think we've won, and that is this whole idea of using cash to buy back shares in a company that's innovating and growing as rapidly as we are. I think we've won that conversation. But the other conversation we have is, you know, we we just don't have the products to span the market. For, for pure autos, and I'm not sure that, um, well, I'm, I'm sure that in the long term, robo-taxis fill that demand, but in the meantime, we do need a broader range of vehicles to cover the full market and to maintain, um, and to maintain position in the marketplace. So I think th those are the open issues that we, we definitely have. Um, I'm very pleased with energy. It's running ahead of my projections, and my projections were very aggressive. Um, very pleased with production, with with um, sales. I kind of anticipated this level of sales. I, I I didn't trust myself, trust my judgment, but all my observations of the delivery, uh, certainly here in the local delivery center in Raleigh, but also my discussions and my observations in Europe indicated to me that sales were much better than people were, were representing to me. And so I, I didn't have the courage of my convictions, otherwise I definitely would have been closer to the mark. So I, I think there's still a lot of open questions. I think we shouldn't be celebrating victory. I think we should be looking forward with um, hope and optimism to uh, this coming couple of months as firstly the quarterly, uh, Earnings are revealed, and then 8.8 is actually revealed for reality. So that's my view. Okay, well, I appreciate that you said that we shouldn't celebrate, but this Q2 was a shock, right? There was a number of things that came out here that no one, few people, if maybe a handful, were predicting this. Why is it that only a few of us were thinking, I know, Jeff, you did, about the delivery being higher than production, being at that level, and then energy was a complete 
bombshell report for all of us, right? Why did this surprise even people like us who are following this so closely? Because analysts are, you know, an analysts get us believing, you know, disbelieving ourselves and believing them. I mean, they, they have the print, they have the monopoly of print. Um, you know, they, they have the monopoly of the megaphone of, of the public in the public discourse. And we're just, um, you know, we're, we're mosquitoes, we're flies and, you know, we, we're, we're just, you know, buzzing around the, the beast. So, I mean, it's very hard. It's extremely hard when, you know, Tesla's in this, as they put it, between waves. It's extremely hard to maintain, you know, the, the philosophy uh, that, that we, you know, we believe in. So I think that's, that's the bottom line. Are ye of little faith? Are we of little faith? <laughs> anyway. No, but you, you even you were surprised, shocked with the 9.4 gigawatt hours, and you are the I person that follows it the most. Hmm? I was absolutely shocked. Absolutely shocked. I, I uh, you know, I, I, I believed the guys who were watching the, the factory floor. But who knows, you know, it, we, we have to see the 10Q. We, we have to hear the quarterly, and we have to hear what the company tells us about deliveries. Yeah. Okay, so what do people think that you're expecting for the uh, earnings? That's going to be July 23rd. Um, it's again not to not to celebrate or anything like that, but it's it's more it's gonna likely be going to be positive than negative, right? Yeah, it's going to be over margin. 60. Yeah, it's going to be over sixty cents, maybe seventy cents. Okay, others, do you want to speak into that, Alexandra? I didn't at all do any Ex prognostics, so I'm sorry, I can't, I can't have any comments. No expectations for July 23rd. How about you, Jeff? No, I think you can, you can sell. There's a lot to celebrate, actually. Um, and I, I agree with Larry in terms of like, hey, there's a lot of unknowns too. But what we do know is that they drew down inventory. Uh, we know that there, there were minimal price changes, if any. In fact, there were probably offsetting price increases. Now they bought down rates. We don't know what percent they're buying down rates and what percent the partner banking institutions are buying down rates if you're you know if you're giving a compelling you know view of like evs being the future of auto i don't know why banks wouldn't want to partner with them uh on the on this rate story but that's even even so that's over five or six years and these phony uh analysts out there that are talking about oh what are, what are the implications of buying down rates well you know it's you will know, we'll find out over five or six years and then they'll go um refinance that as well. So I think it's a very smart move on Tesla's part. They cut probably 15% of the company and huge amounts of cost during that quarter. And they're going to take a charge for that. And we're going to see that, but we're also going to see it in ongoing performance that, you know, that, you know, they're going to be able to, you know, project, you know, higher margins. And I do agree with Larry that we need to hear from the company on where they see that going. But I, I see I see auto gross margins having a shot at at you know at least in the second half of this year of getting the twenty percent again <clears throat> in, in this quarter. I mean maybe they're over nineteen. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, there's a lot of puts and takes. And when you're shipping, you know, inventory built from the prior quarter, um, you know, it, it's sometimes these things are a little bit harder to predict. But I think they're definitely on a favorable trajectory with with gross margins. So. I haven't done any EPS calculations, but <clears throat> when I look at the like the business and the actions the company is taking of drawing down inventory off the balance sheet, remember they got, got rid of all those energy products too. I mean, they're not building, you know, at at 9.4 gigawatt uh, rates in a quarter. So that means they drew down a bunch of energy inventory during the quarter as well. So there's tremendous balance sheet inventory that came out between auto and energy. And, uh, and that's a big deal. And then they got the rate of the production of the Cybertruck. You know, they doubled it throughout the quarter. Now it's only running at maybe 20% of its terminal rate. Uh, but that move as well is going to help uh, with cost structure and with inventory. It's, it's still going to be a net drag, um, you know, but it's helping. And, and my theory, by the way, on uh, extending the foundation series is, is they still have more work to do on the cost side. It's actually not a favorable uh, thing, but it's a favorable thing is that they're going to, you know, balance it out and charge more for longer. Um, so 
I, I actually think there's a lot of things you can think about celebrating immediately, but there are unknowns. You know, we'll find more, we'll find out more about on, uh, you know, July 23rd. And it would be great if you had a strong gross margin print on autos and energy and you had strong guidance from the company of like, hey, we think we're, we're, we're pretty structurally sound here. Like we figured a bunch of stuff out. Uh, and then finally, they're going to start taking on a bunch of inventory again, probably in Q4 and Q1 as they ramp these new vehicles that they promised. So um, this is a you know fairly big period coming. I agree uh, with Larry on that in the near term, but also just the second half of the year because they'd have to crank up deliveries. You know, you know, to you know, they got to hit 500k pretty consistently to you know to get to the 18. Over to, to do more than they did the prior year. So, I don't know who I was speaking to this morning, but they said that given where Tesla is today, that you know they they beat on the production delivery, the energy is pretty significant. That institutional analysts who are sitting on the sidelines will now need to rethink this and get back in because me. they're going to. That was you, okay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're either, they're either at zero weight or ninety percent underweight. I mean, they're they got to get in. A, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, so the so Tesla's underperformed the S and P and the Nasdaq. They're underweight. There is zero weight or underweight net, you know. So yeah, they're gonna they're gonna have. I mean, they're gonna have to, or they're they're going to like miss out and, and get fired. There's there's two options. Okay, JP, are you there? Are you a speaker? I can't tell who's a speaker. So, yes, can you? What what's your thoughts on that? No, JP's not a speaker. How about you, Lord? He Justin. is a speaker. Okay. It's unlike JP not to want to speak. Come on, JP. All right. Uh, Justin, do you have thoughts on that? Uh, you know, my perspective is that, uh, you know, I don't track any of that stuff. I don't track EPS. I don't track deliveries. Um, I'm solely focused on trying to think about how I'm going to hold on to the rally. That's all I, it, I, I know it's coming. And uh, frankly, I don't care how the market arrives at it. I don't care what the narrative is. I know it's coming. I'm just trying to focus on how am I going to trade it and capitalize on it. That's all. Yeah, it's coming. Okay. So is there anything else, anything that was a drag on the stock that's, that is still a drag on the stock? If, am, I, am I forgetting something that we're all, you know, <laughs> overhangs? It seems like the stock a share, you know, Elon's shareholder. Not that it's done, but it's a lot less of an overhang before. You've got uh, the move to Texas allows that to happen. You've got P and D numbers. You got energy showing up finally. Anything uh, that a, was a, a drag? Yeah, go ahead. I'll give you a drag. Lower production. <laughs> of course you would. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, lower production means you know higher uh, overhead per car. It's gonna, it's gonna increase with no doubt. It's gonna increase the cost per vehicle, so that is a drag without doubt. I mean, when production goes down, costs go up. That's just a reality. Now, whether it's offset by you know, supply chain balance uh, improvements, uh, cost improvements, I don't know. But generally, when 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 revenue when when production goes down, the cost per vehicle has to go up because the same factories are producing less vehicles and that that is a drag on gross profit so there's that uh jeff can you answer that because i thought you told me that that's an inventory from q1 or like the inventory was hanging there from q1 right well there's two different things there's two different things there's working capital and then there what larry's talking about is the transformation cost in the factory and the capital and the labor efficiency uh, the only thing, Larry, I just don't, I don't know, is it, it wasn't, it's not fixed labor and it's not fixed capital quarter yeah. over quarter. They, they, they took, they took reductions out of direct labor in the factory. That was part of the people that were being informed that they were being let go in the quarter. So um, depends how they, depends how they reflect it. But you're in general, you're correct. When, if, if production is lower and you have the same number of people and you have the same uh, capital, uh, you know, structure or, or uh, amount out there on the floor, uh, you're going to take uh, a, tr a cog's hit on the transformation side, on the on the system level assembly side. But like I said, they took they took people out. I don't know if they took, I don't know if they physically deprecated capital and they moved it over to prototyping operations for new vehicles. 
I don't know if they did that or not. I would have done that if I were them, uh, but I'm not running their operation. So I don't know if they even needed to do that. But yeah, the, 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 in general, I agree, but they did take action. So the question is, is how they reflected and both in the quarter and how they reflected going forward. What I think they did is they took actions on direct labor, knowing that, you know, this period between April and call it the new vehicles ramping that, you know, they basically have, they've, they've improved efficiencies in the factory where they can do more with less. They improve station efficiencies and so forth. And they're like, okay, we don't need as many people, but when we start to ramp these new vehicles, my guess is they're going to be calling a bunch of people back in Q4. And I think Q4 is going to kind of be a, a bigger, uh, is there, there's going to be some cost burden in Q4. Cause I think they're going to be doing, anytime you do a new product ramp, you're going to be bringing in inventory. You're going to be bringing in people and they're not going to be fully trained. The lines aren't going to be fully efficient. And if anything, there'll be a net drag in, in Q4 and in Q1 of next year. But I actually think like they're, they may be in a little bit of a sweet spot, Q2 and three of this year where they can really make a lot of progress. But it's hard that these things are hard to predict from the outside of the company, to be honest with everyone. To what extent did Elon already know that this was what the outcome? Because in the annual shareholder meeting, he already said, I think Q2 is going to be better than Q1. He had already seen this uh, by then, right? It was pretty timely. He said that on the earnings call. He said that in, 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 uh, in end of April. Oh, okay. So the, yeah. was this then just a surprise to him too that they got to this point? No, I think, I mean, well, I think a lot happens in that third month, to be honest. I right. think there's a lot of puts and takes, but I think they, I, I, I go, it goes back to like, if you do the analysis from Q1 and why, why was the number 387,000 deliveries versus, you know, 430,000, there's a pretty basic answer that you could arrive to. And, and we had those conversations and a Tesla knew it. And, and, and as soon as they got into this quarter, they're like, you know, there's a real run rate once they get the Model 3 refresh, they get the supply unlocked on that. They know the run rate of Model Y. They get and they, they already did the, the the they already had the the offset put in for the Red Sea, and therefore everything's already following that new route. So like all they knew it. I mean he knew he knew kind of in April where they where they saw it going. They didn't know exactly where it's going to be, and it's probably you know plus or minus ten percent in terms of you know, what they know it in the second or third week of a quarter versus the end of a quarter. But yeah, I think the other question we have to ask ourselves is, you know, there's a lot of people that are counting cars. Like, why are they off, you know, this amount? And, you know, what what's happening with that process? Is it reliable? Because if you just went off a of fact set and you just went off of the analyst, they were far closer. They were in the, they were actually in the low 440s and in, in in mid to high 430s. So that, you know, that, that, you know, that swath of analyst estimates was, you know, actually closer. Uh, so, and, and they have people watching this stuff too and, and counting, but I think everybody was pretty surprised on the energy side. So I think we need to understand it. As Larry said, we need to see the tank queue, uh, you need to understand it better, but you know, in general, you look at the backdrop, you look at just Tesla three weeks ago, you got a company, you didn't know how the vote was going to go. You didn't know how the quarter was going to end. And, you know, both of those things have, have swung very favorably for the company. Okay. Can you guys give me a sense of what, pers like, the stock from the last five days has jumped by 25% from 180 to 230. Today is a Tuesday when we're recording this. And uh, Dan Ives had said that when the comp plan was uh, resolved, or not resolved, but, you know, the approval from the shareholder a second time around, that he thought it was around a $40 overhang. Can you guys give like a rough estimate of what you think is happening here? Um, in my view, and as I ask people, the vast majority of this jump is simply because of auto. I still don't believe that um, that energy or or in, you know the promise of the growth story of and a robo taxi is is even started yet. But or do you guys think that it's already there? What percentage would be? Let's start with you, Justin. I know you said you you might need to leave soon. Uh, so what was the question? <laughs> the, you know, the stock jump, what would you attribute it to? What percentage to auto, what percentage to energy, and what percentage to stories? 
Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, you know, my, my perspective, as you know, is, uh, you know, that Tesla is going to be going through a great repricing. And what that means is they're going to be valued as a SaaS company and not as an automobile company. I think that that's a process and a transition. I don't, uh, like, when I look at the last couple of days, I mean, I, I view it more from, like, a technical lens, like a technical breakout, and then, you know, this is just more good news, and also we had the markets rallying this whole week. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know. I think uh, everyone knows that when money rotates out of NVIDIA, it has to broaden out. Tesla's the only one of the MAG-7 that has such a, an atrocious year-to-date performance. Um, so, I mean, I think there's a lot of catch-up to do, and that was just my perspective. I don't really, you know, for me, I'm thinking over the next five years, uh, and I stay laser-focused on that. So anything that happens on the day-to-day, I honestly just do not pay any attention to, unless it's related to one of my catalysts, right, um, or related to any kind of uh, potential breakthroughs or milestones related to FSD, autonomy, Optimus. But until then, I mean, when you plug it into a model, you're really crunching numbers uh, and deriving most of the valuation um, after year three, four, five, onward to year 10, year 15. So whatever happens in the day-to-day doesn't matter, in my opinion. And I think CERN also ha- had a really great post on this. They kind of quantified that, that point. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really attribute it to anything, to be honest. I just think that Tesla will transition and it's about the market, you know, rationalizing how they're going to value it over time and that changing. And I think that we're seeing some early people jump on board. We're going to see people, you know, late adopters probably feeling more comfortable buying above 250, closer to 300 when things are a little bit more uh, transparent. But for everyone else, you know, our advantage as retail investors is that we can benefit from time arbitrage, meaning we don't have to report to any other constituents on a quarterly basis or try to defend you know, our decisions. We can simply buy and hold. So that's your edge. And uh, anything else for me is uh, completely irrelevant. Yeah, thank you so much, Justin. We'll go to Larry, Sat, and then we'll uh, invite up Stock Talk. Yeah, that was a great an- analysis of, of where we are. I think that the... Um, we, we should remain laser focused on the long term. In the meantime, Dan Ives just announced, you know, his yet again, he's up up upping his his guidance. I mean, I think Dan Ives is one of the greatest of, of the analysts, but it just shows you how behind the the curve all analysts are by definition. So why did he drop his price target um, to 275 to only rise it back up to 300? And he now has a bull case of 400. This just happened. So, I mean, the point is all of these analysts are looking at, you know, the immediate near term and, you know, the so-called catalysts. And we should all remain focused on the long term of which I think there's a much better case uh, to be made. As the long term becomes nearer and nearer in focus, so these analysts, even the Dan Ives, are going to you know become more and more uh, convinced, and they're going to implement these um, these targets. It's it's our advantage in the marketplace that we see this ahead of us. We see this ahead of the analysts. And, you know, I think that this is a really uh, a great opportunity uh, for us. Remains a great opportunity, less of a great opportunity now that the market's begun to wake up, but still a great opportunity. So that's okay, so. Sat? Yeah, one thing I can say is that uh, the, the fluctuation of these prices is interesting because it's, it's happened even during that six-year period when uh, it was kind of down the entire time, but it wasn't generally speaking, but you have these upswings and it's been a while since we had a double digit, uh, like 10% or more uh, swing in one day. And Tesla usually swings very quickly when it swings up. Uh, But it's also like, even if a a company is, you know, having a bad financial, whatever, what Wall Street and analysts want to put, if you keep on selling it at a certain point, it's oversold and it becomes 
undervalued in terms of the stock and where it's supposed to be. So at a certain point, when the numbers has a surprise and Wall Street loves realized numbers, that's effective today and it beat their as estimates and ex expectations that's when it like oh hey yeah, it's good and then, then let's go back in right and so it's been sold out for a very long time it's on tesla has underperformed compared to other tech companies so you have this surprise thing it's oh now they're back on track so quote unquote because they love the three to six month period short-term thinking so that's why i think the market moves heavily when you have these surprises and it's been it's been kind of down for a while now and so you have these fluctuations that come and go uh, and certain p parts we don't we don't know like we don't know sometimes it beats it and sometimes it doesn't and uh, these uh, and estimates are kind of arbitrary in some sense but the real number is that a lot of the main uh, the market looks at is what's happening right now with the uh, tangible numbers whereas we're looking at the bigger picture looking at where the growth structure is going and the Tesla energy like I really want to know the gross margins for that uh, um, nine point four gigawatt hours. Uh, that's a huge jump from what we had before. So uh, those numbers are going to be much more significant in my eyes because that's, I'm looking at the growth part of it and not today's numbers. But the market loves today's numbers, and that's why I think it's you see the moves right now. Excellent. Welcome, Stock Talk. Um, so we talked about were you surprised with what you saw with the numbers today? Do you think that there's a narrative change? Maybe you want to answer what percentage of the stock jump is from auto, what for percentage is from the, you know, people wanted to get into before Robotaxi comes. What's your thoughts? Um, I think it's a little bit of all three, but, you know, I saw a lot of people today talking about um, the delivery numbers this morning and certainly not enough people talking about the energy numbers. Um, I mean, if I had to guess, I, I think most of the move today was in light of the energy numbers. I think the big thing here that, People fail to realize, and this is sort of along the lines of the conversation that we had uh, last time I was on uh, your show, which was around RoboTaxi. And I think there was somebody on the panel at that time. I can't remember who it was. I don't want to uh, misquote and, and label it being somebody that it wasn't. But somebody on the panel at that time was making the argument um, that analysts on the street won't be willing to model robo taxis into their valuations until they happen and i mentioned at that time that i disagree with that outlook because firstly stocks are forward-looking secondly analysts are forward-looking and thirdly very rarely do you need a new vertical to actually culminate in production for analysts to begin modeling it in fact that's actually much more rare than analysts modeling it in a forward-looking speculative manner. So are some analysts willing to speculate earlier than others? Yeah, sure. And in fact, when it comes to Tesla, those analysts have been the ones that have been right, right? Like Dan Ives, for example, that Larry just referenced earlier. Dan Ives has been willing to speculate, um, which has been a good thing in this case, because it's allowed him to be ahead of the curve on some of these developments. Now, the Tesla retail community um, has also been willing to speculate, and that's why they've been able to get ahead of these developments uh, before the street does. And the energy storage, in my view, uh, in light of today's numbers, has hit a major inflection point. Um, no one on the street, and I read every single analyst estimates for these Q2 numbers, no one on the street was modeling anywhere close to 9.4 gigawatt hours in deployment. In fact, Adam Jonas's Morgan Stanley, I believe, was at about half of that. And he is a major bull. Um, so it remains to be seen how exactly they achieved this. I mean, I, I'd love to, to learn the operational nuance behind it. We don't have all the details yet of what they did differently this quarter to allow for this. But if you look at the chart of all-time deployments on a quarterly basis, this is clearly a trend-breaking quarter. Now... Have there been quarters historically that have been clumpy? Yes. Have there been multi-quarter periods that have been relatively stable? Yes. But because this is so far out of line with prior history on energy deployments, in my view, this is an inflection. Now, could I be wrong? Sure. But I'm willing to speculate that it is. And what I'll say more so than that <clears throat> is that following these numbers – which again, 132% quarter over quarter is a maddening number. Like that is insane. I think people realize the magnitude of uh, that sort of quarter over quarter jump. But 
in light of that, seeing Tesla drop prices for commercial mega packs <clears throat> following this huge beat, a lot of people were tweeting about it this morning and saying, oh, you know, why are they dropping prices? I don't get it. Demand seems great for energy deployment. I mean, you have 132% quarter quarter. Why would you drop prices? This is the same type of um, lack of strategic thinking that had people criticizing price cuts. Now, were the price cuts on the vehicle side done for an entirely different reason? Yes. But at the end of the day, both of these are strategic operational decisions. And I'll explain why. When Tesla cut prices of cars, my argument was always that they did it because they could. Because their competitors could not, right? If you looked at the margin profiles of the rest of the industry, they just couldn't afford to cut prices to inflect demand when there was an industry slowdown. Tesla could afford to do that. So they made that operational decision, which in my view was the correct operational decision at the time. I don't think billions of dollars in advertising would have solved that problem like other people in the community do. So I defended that decision to cut prices in the cars then, and I'll defend the decision to cut prices in, in, on the energy side today. And the reason for that is, is because Elon knows what he's doing here. <clears throat> You're capturing lightning in a bottle. When you have a spark in demand like this on the energy side of the business, you have two choices. You can either capitalize from an earnings standpoint and say, well, we're going to keep prices where they are, or many businesses would actually raise prices in a scenario like this, which is what your conventional legacy business would do. They would say, well, deployments are up 132% quarter over quarter. Let's raise prices so that next quarter we can earn more on this demand. What Elon is instead doing is trying to hit a major inflection in volume, which is, I believe is the correct strategic decision here. He's taking advantage of what was a huge beat inter-quarter on the energy side and using it as a reflection of forward demand to say, look, if I cut prices on the mega pack for commercial customers by 45%, I'm going to blow this game open from a volume standpoint, have much, much higher market penetration. And the beauty of, of, of that strategy here is, is Tesla's energy business has proven one thing discernibly over competitors, which is that they have a number of repeat clients and their products are dramatically more sticky than they are in the rest of the industry. You know, a lot of people like to allude to the fact that there's a lot of competition in energy storage. There is. But Tesla's brand power has proven to be a differentiating factor here. It's proven to be sticky with commercial customers. And I think Elon's looking to take advantage of that. And I think it's the right decision here because the more quickly they hit enormous scale on the energy side, the more convincing it'll be to the rest of the street that this has to be modeled into the stock and not just has to be modeled in the stock in a forward-looking manner, has to be modeled in the stock today. So I think a lot of this move today was uh, a, an anticipation of a re-rating of the stock behind the energy business. Um, I think today where we stand, it's hit a major inflection point. I think you're going to see that reflect in the coming quarters. Um, and that doesn't even have anything to do with uh, you know, uh, robo taxi or, or Optimus programs, which are obviously the big golden gooses at the end of the, the end of the tunnel. So, um, yeah, I thought today was in extremely positive. I was not expecting anywhere close uh, to that number for the energy business. No one on the street was expecting that. So, not only was this a pleasant surprise, I think the stock move today was uh, more than well deserved. I, I do not think it was an overreaction. I think that, in fact, I, I would have been surprised to see the stock go even higher than it did intraday. I think wow. it was completely yeah. deserved. Yeah. Big statements, uh, Stock Talk. Thank you. I did not think that you would say that it's energy, not auto. Now, would we be expecting that institutional analysts should be doing shows and where they're being interviewed? They need to now start talking energy. Are you going to expect that that to happen? Well, oh, I want to hear JP, of course. That's his, his space. But what's your thought on that, Stock Talk? Yeah, I think they'll, they'll have to. I mean, Adam Jonas mentioned this in his note this morning. He said he's had institutional uh, entities reach out to him and ask them about their proprietary Tesla energy model. So they wouldn't be doing that if they weren't interested in modeling it themselves. So, yeah, uh, short answer see? to your question, they will, they will be doing yep. that. They're forced now. Okay, JP. Hey, guys. Um, by the way, great, like, synopsis all the way around. Thanks for having me up. Appreciate it. I'm going to try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, but I'm just going to piggyback off what Stock Talk was saying. The 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 energy play now and the acceleration. There's one fear that post election IRA could potentially be rolled back. So there is reason to accelerate and try to go as fast as possible because it is a land grab. It's not just sell the product 
um, which Rohan has agreed to do spaces with me and Alexander twice. I think whatever is dancing around, like we got to do it soon, but like it's a land grab because it's kind of like building cell towers. It's energy networks is that's what storage allows people to do. The services part of the business will ultimately become like a hundred percent free cash flow. Right now it's like optimizing your CapEx and OpEx to like deploy this and get it out there and get it like in the net, in the grid and with behind the meter solutions. But realistically that software solution, which kind of like stock talk was kind of talking about why the Tesla brand power, what the specialization there is. And to be fair, Morgan Stanley and Jonas don't really highlight as much because Goldman for some reason has been like the bank that Tesla has done a lot of the energy corporate access information related to and not Morgan Stanley. So I think there's a little bit of like differentiation between the banks and how the stock gets covered. Um, the Goldman's a much bigger commodity shop. And I think the energy transition, um, for some reason they were highlighting and doing like corporate access or investor access through Goldman and not through, through Jonas. And like, that's why it wasn't as well covered under Adam, but clearly the energy is ramping faster. I can't wait to see what the services revenue looks like. Cause when that hits beyond the hardware, that's when this will really compound and people will start to freak out about what this looks like on a go forward basis. But I think the, maybe the one thing that like, I haven't heard anyone say that I think is kind of super, super important. The last two earnings call, right? What Elon said about volumes being circumstantial or event driven was a hundred percent true, right? The rerouting around Africa, the issues with production, the shutdowns, Berlin, it wasn't quote unquote bullshit excuses. And there was a demand trend down. It, what he said is what it was. And to be fair, Q2 is really shitty for a lot of automakers. Like inventory, days of inventory, Jeff could probably highlight and look up. Like you're, you're talking, it's like almost a hundred days as close to the average across the largest automakers, what they're sitting on. And Tesla is drawing it down without price cuts and like steep discounts. So that means the intrinsic trend is that the auto demand for Tesla is higher than the average other OEM. And in an up cycle, when there's actually like, you know, there's a, about to be another like turn of like auto upgrading of, of aged out vehicles, like that's just positioning Tesla in a better position on the auto side. And then energy is going to be this like non, um, it's going to be like a secular business with massive upside that people are starting to get a hang on. And then if and when RoboTaxi and Optus, all that stuff comes in, people are going to be like, holy shit. Because like, to be fair, you know, Elon can feel or appear to people who don't pay attention like he's full of shit sometimes. And given how chaotic it's been the last like five plus years ish, but like he what he's saying is what's happening and he is making it happen. And I think it's going to be much harder to doubt him going forward relative to the position of the company, the brand, and how they're operating. And like one more thing to Jeff's point, like the margins, Jeff is kind of nailing it. I understand where Larry's talking about with like the reduced production, or the cost went up, but like I, that's largely, I believe, offset against the reduction in workforce. Um, cutting out at 15%, like, yeah, there's a charge, but like the OPEX you're going to get go forward is like very strong. And like, you know, the corporate workers may be a little bit more of a charge than like the line workers, but like the the improvement to the new motor line on the hairpin assembly that the three Y and the new three have, and then the new Y will have, like that's a hundred percent automated on the powertrains that they make the most. So like getting people out of that process is just accretive to margins going forward. And it's actually a cheaper engine and it's actually more reliable and less parts, et cetera, da, 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 whatever. But like there's so much operating leverage go forward after kind of like these dark days. And I think that it's very clear that we're seeing Tesla be able to os oscillate deliveries um, in different regions now to cater to demand a lot more dynamically than what a lot of people has expected. Uh, so JP, you, uh, Larry Goldberg and uh, Matt Smith, you guys follow energy quite well. Uh, Larry said that he was shocked even based on his conservative kind of his forecast. And then do you think, can you guess whether or not you think this 9.4 gigawatt hour, this Q2, is this just a blip or is this a indication that this is going to be what we're going to see for the next no, several quarters? I think at some point this year, maybe the tail end, you'll see the Labdorp max capacity from 40 gigawatt hours be guided higher because 
Martin, when he gave the Goldman tour, um, there's some on record quotes from anonymized sources of investors who were at Ladthorpe at early days. Um, and Martin even commented kind of loosely, and then they never really followed up with it because the other thing that like Stock Talk is kind of alluding to, the marketplace for energy is much more efficient and the competition is a lot stronger um, and the penetration is there. The value is how can you display the software for multiple application uses in a variety of solution oriented uh, solutions that are required based on the the, the customer uh, the customer customer need. I'm I'm fairly confident that we're going to see at least maybe a 50 55 gigawatt in increase and they're going to say like the capacity can actually go up. I mean, these are very large things and actually the logistics of moving them is actually one of the encumbering processes. The straddle carriers that were special order like I suggest people kind of look at these. I've said it a million times, but like most straddle carriers are long legs and you see them at ports and they like lift, they unload large cargo ships um, and they're massive and they have these super high legs. These things need to be able to go into the factory and then come out to the parking lot. It's a very bespoke order. Not many people need this. So these are special order machines. Um, there was indications that Tesla increased from two when the factory first launched to six. It appears there's more than six there now, which means that they can get through the line and then get them out and then make the next one faster and then move them to trains or trucks for out for deployment. So I don't think that, you know, I think it's going to be, I, I don't feel 100% confident saying next quarter is going to be another, you know, 10 gigawatt quarter, but I think I feel confident saying the trend line is this is not like, want a one-off of a top of we're going to see like six then nine and then eight and then nine like we might see eight next quarter and then 13 the following and then you know they give a guidance to a 50 to 60 gigawatt hour you know capacity and then in a couple of years it's going to be 80 to 100. yeah and another thing just to piggyback on that i mean these sort of trends are much more infectious with commercial customers and municipalities than they are with retail customers and and Elon knows that. And so, you know, if if you're one of those people that's asking yourself why cut prices on the commercial products after a jump in demand like this on the energy side, that's the answer to your question, which is the networking efficiencies that JP was alluding to, but also the fact that these things are hard to replace, the fact that you have additional logistical and software efficiencies when you continue to use the same branded products across all of your needs and on top of that all you know, these municipality, municipalities and commercial customers that are adopting these systems um, are serving as kind of brand representatives for Tesla. Because, you know, when another city or another company is like considering energy storage systems, uh, they're going to look at these other examples um, as a testament to how well those products work and what sort of efficiencies those products are driving. So it's kind of a self-feeding loop. And you know, the idea of wanting to push volume now is the right decision, in my view. And if cutting price, uh, you know, on certain products is the way to do that, then that's the right move. Yeah. And just to be clear, I don't think that the cutting price and like this is where I think auto has suffered. I think it's just longer to the lead times. But like the majority, the largest single cost of the mega pack or the storage is the sell cost. And to be frank, the the sell costs are in legitimate free fall. I don't think they've been cheaper ever, like ever, ever. And there's not really a bottom where they are. And Tesla's like the buyer of last resort. Like Cadell's making them and they're trying to do in this business. But like Tesla's, I think Tesla's got their sales. And I feel I'm like 90% confidence interval that this is true. Like Tesla can interchange the sales for storage or auto at their own discretion. So the fact that they can just be a constant buyer and and be reliable to their suppliers, they're getting like the, the absolute best pricing. And I don't think it's impeding the margin of this business. But I think this is again like just to talk like help people frame this. There's a reason why like Verizon or AT&T like give you your cell phone at zero percent financing or give you a cell phone free. They want you to sign up for the plan, the reoccurring plan, the hardware for battery. Has, is one aspect. It's a good business. It pays for itself in its own growth. Like Elon runs them like separate businesses to an extent. The ongoing software revenue relevant to energy management services, like that 
is going to be a multi-decade reoccurring business that is not going to be easily swapped out. So once you're like locked into a municipality or a large corporate, um, you know, or school system, a hospital network or whatever it is, like you're going to pretty much be there forever the same way like telephone wires got laid, you know, in the 20s and 30s. So like this is a land grab, a race to get out there. And to be frank, like what people underestimate when they talk about like China, et cetera, like do, you know, when you're talking about hybrid grids, like in Texas being a really good, like California's always needed it. But if you look at how troubled the Texas grid was prior to like literally 18 months ago, they've been the quickest adoption of multi-generation and storage solutions. And Tesla has become like one of the biggest allies, obviously for numer numerous reasons, but like they don't have the grid problems anymore. We've had massive heat waves. We've had massive cold waves. Tesla's, I mean, Texas is not dealing with these rolling blackouts or surges or fires like they were kind of dealing with a few, just a few years ago. So red state, blue state, whatever, it doesn't matter. Like it's making the energy more stable. The peak demand curves are lower. The costs are lower. And it's in, it's like both at the retail level for people's homes and at the state level for operating and running your services and systems, like it's winning. And I don't think people are going to get fired you know, if you install a Tesla system and if you're worried about having a Chinese company access your power grid that potentially helped to nuclear power or large solar arrays or not gas plants, right? And and they could just be shut off because it's a Chinese run company. Like those are the questions okay. that come into play when you're making these decisions. Okay. Thank, thank you so much, JP. Appreciate that. You you explained a, little, a lot about what's going to happen with energy. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.